live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation? And welcome to another exciting episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime and a dynamic panel today for sure. And let me just run away and let them handle the show. And I'll tell you why. The last time we did the Karen Reed case, the hate mail, the COE is saying, why are you saying that? But the hate mail came, the tweets came. The, I'm getting tweets before this show even started, but that's the whole reason we're doing the show. Uh, as the old expression goes, don't shoot the messenger. Today, uh, in addition to covering the case, and there was a hearing this morning, um, and uh, Melanie Little is going to help us break that down because she's the only one for full disclosure that I know of who watched the entire thing fully. I had a couple of meetings uh, this morning and tried to catch up on it. So uh, we're going to get to that in a moment. But for those uh, who do not know, this is uh, quite the case, uh, a circus of a case, and it is incredibly polarizing. Karen Reed is the girlfriend of late Boston police officer John O'Keefe. Uh, she's been accused of backing over John O'Keefe in Canton, Massachusetts, and leaving him to die on a snowy evening in January 2022 as a blizzard uh, uh, bared down on Canton, Mass. She, however, says she wasn't even there when it happened uh, and that she is, in fact, being framed. Uh, but one of the questions I have today, um, that is obviously a uh, defense that is uh, going to turn some heads, but it has done a lot more than that. It has got um, parts of Massachusetts split in two and other people in the nation who are following this case. So um, let's get down to the brass tacks, as they say. Melanie Little is joining us. She has uh, 25 plus years on her resume uh, close to 30 as a trial lawyer in New York State federal courts. Uh, she was actually the lead attorney for the plaintiffs in the clergy sex abuse case as depicted in the film Spotlight. That's one of my favorite movies, an amazing movie. She's a frequent guest, a legal analyst. Most importantly, she is the mother of five, and uh, she has a YouTube channel uh, at Attorney Melanie Little. So please check out her channel, and uh, she's been covering this. She's also an actress, not unlike our next guest, Daryl Cohen, who's uh, a famous actor and a famous entertainment and criminal defense attorney. He looks puzzled right now. <laughs> uh, he is with the uh, firm Cohen, Cooper, Estep, and Whiteman in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, he's on court TV all the time. And last but certainly not least, you've got Megan Sachs, a full professor of criminology and the graduate program director at Fairleigh Dickinson University in my home state of New Jersey. Uh, she teaches classes including women in crime, serial killers, and crime policy. And she and uh, her good friend Amy, they host two podcasts, not one, Amy Schlossberg, Women and Crime and Direct Appeal, Women in Crime and Direct Appeal. So welcome to one and all. Melanie Little. Why is this case so incredibly polarizing? Why am I getting tweets ahead of the show saying I'm not watching because of this person or that person? I'm tuning it out, but thanks anyway. Why? Oh, because of me. <laughs> because of me, they don't <laughs> want to watch it. Um, you can say it. It's fine. Uh, I think the, it, it, people are either on one side or the other of this case. There is no middle ground here. People who are deep into this case are either pro-defense or they're pro-prosecution, there's no middle ground. I think the people of Massachusetts, many of them are fed up. I think that many of them uh, are mad as hell and they're not gonna take it anymore. And I think that you know there could be in their minds a history of corruption in Massachusetts and they wanna see all of that exposed. The people on the other side of this believe that Karen Reed 100% intended to murder her police officer boyfriend and that she should be convicted of murder. So there's really no middle ground here. And I've never, ever seen a case that is anything like this in my career or of any of the cases that I've covered. It's insanity. Yeah, and, and Melanie, I mean, just to your point, you said, and 
It's kind of true. Getting tweets saying, hey, Melanie Little's on the show. I'm not watching, which I am never going to not have a, a best guest on because of that. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I'll invite her back on. Um, but we had a, a very interesting last show the last time we did this. But what is it about what you're saying, do you think, that they're unhappy with? I don't know. Everything that I've reported on about this case, I have read from the court documents. I have read from official police reports. I have, you know, broken down the hearings with my viewers. So everything that I'm saying on my channel comes directly from the court file or the hearings or um, other documentation, police reports, the investigation. So I don't know. I guess they just don't want to hear what I have to say. And, you know, there are some polarizing figures on let's just say the Karen Reed side of this case, people that I don't know, I've never met before. I have no allegiance to, uh, I'm a New York attorney. I have no connection to anyone in this case. So I guess they don't want to hear it from my point of view. Let's just say they don't like what I have to say. I don't know why. Well, that's what makes this country great. You can say something and someone doesn't have to agree with you. Look at Boston, Sarah, Melanie nailed it. We're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. Uh, that is part of it. Boston, Sarah, don't be mad at me. Come to my book signing in Boston on May 16th, Thursday, May 16th, 7.30 p.m. at Hummingbird Books in Boston, and you can meet Carm. Uh, so everyone, and I'll mention that later in the show. You know why? Because we've got a big Boston contingency today, and I need people from Boston to show us some love. So Boston, Sarah, please come out. Kristen says, uh, Melanie Little is the greatest. Daryl Cohen, uh, you've been in the business uh, a few days You've been around uh, crazy cases, crazy trials. I, myself, I mean, you go back to, uh, you know, Michael Jackson, and that was a circus. You go back to OJ, and that was a circus. But this is a case that has got a very specific geographic location, you know, Boston, Canton, that whole area. And the people who are um, involved um, or, or have involved themselves in being, you know, in following the case and trial watching are – just besides themselves one way or another what is it about this that is causing that well let's start with the fact there actually is a middle ground and it's called the jury they will decide whether or not this case where karen was framed and by the way i'm glad this is not being tried in framingham because we'd really have a problem <laughs> so they're going to decide whether or not she was framed whether or not she's guilty not guilty or a hung jury, which is perhaps the worst part. This is crazy. But remember, he came back to the scene. So if she really tried to murder him, would she have come back? Or did she come back just to see if he was dead? Or did she come back to try and help him? There's so many questions. It's going to be very interesting to see how it rolls. Now, I know there was a hearing today, and I know the judge chose not to throw out the charges, which does not surprise me. Her lawyers did what they needed to do. If you don't ask, you don't get. So the answer is no, not at this point. Let's roll on. Mm. Uh, look at this. Lindsay is going to be at the book signing. Love it. Jennifer Jansen. Um, when are you in Manhattan? We'll be there May 14th. Um, someone messaged me immediately after yesterday. I wasn't even talking about the book. I didn't mention the book one time yesterday, but someone messaged me and I posted it on Instagram at Surviving the Survivor right after on Facebook Messenger because we have a presence on Facebook. And they said, I'm so sick of you talking about yourself, to which I said, uh, you must have had a very unhappy childhood and <laughs> told her to go buzz right off. And uh, it continued from there. And um, the COE is like, why are you engaging with these people? And I said, because it's fun. So it's my show. And I can talk about myself periodically, but I'll try now to. Um, Megan, to you. Sorry, my jersey came out of me for a moment. Um, it did. I, I liked it. <laughs> same, as long same, as you didn't come out of your jersey, then we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Megan, sa same thing here. Um, this is just one of those cases where, like you saw a second ago, we're mad as hell. We're not going to take it anymore. Even either they believe Karen Reed did it, or they firmly believe she did not do it. By the way, here is a, a picture in Happier Times, I believe, at Fenway. That uh, has to be Fenway. Uh, it's Karen Reed and her ex boyfriend John O'Keefe, a handsome fellow, a pretty woman. Yeah. Uh, happier Times, but Megan, what do you think? Um, why well, the polarization? Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I've seen polarizing cases before, but I agree, nothing like this. Um, I think that one of the the big factors at play here is the fact that this is almost like a David versus Goliath, right? You have like this one woman, she's just one person, 
She's accused of this crime, which in itself is newsworthy because she's not the type of person we think, you know, in criminology that we think is going to commit this crime. There's a young, beloved police officer here, a man who's raising his niece and nephew. Um, you know, people really are endeared to him and they really care. They're invested in him as well. And then you have the possibility that this woman is being framed by the entire police department. So you've got your um, real Goliath there and it's almost implausible, yet there seems to be some evidence that it is plausible. Um, so it's shocking to hear at first. And then as I think they unroll a few more bits and bits, people are really questioning is this even possible could this many people be involved in this type of frame up and you know we've never really seen anything like this before as well um also i just want to point out that uh, in criminology we know happen to know now that the timing for this is unfortunate because if you look at the surveys you know public public confidence in policing right now is not at a high um, it's pretty low at this point, unfortunately. And so I think it coincides with that. There's just this you know, lack of faith in some police departments or policing as a whole. And, and I think kind of a mistrust where it's the time is right for someone like Karen Reed and these allegations to be taken seriously. Hmm. Again, um, this the purpose of this podcast today is just go over some of the facts, F-A-C-T-S, and um, also to continue to discuss, you know, why some people are not buying uh, what are at least deemed to be uh, facts. So we'll get we'll get to that. I want to get to Melanie in a moment about the hearing today. But first, Daryl, uh, this super chat here from Jose, um, Boston resident here. Better come to the book signing May 16th. Uh, Karen Reed knows of the cover up because she was there when the fight happened. However, they pulled the reverse uno card on her i mean daryl obviously one of the big theories the defense theory is that there was this massive cover-up by uh the canton police department because uh the other police officer there is brothers with the canton pd uh kevin albert um wouldn't it be really hard to and i'm asking now i'm not saying i'm asking would it be very difficult to get all these people to conspire against karen reed simultaneously I think if they tried to, they would perspire because when you have more than one person telling a story and the story is exactly the same, you have to make sure that all of those people other than the one are on board. And not only do they have to be on board, but it needs to be scripted. This makes no sense to me that it could be this type of conspiracy with this type of range, this type of of reach. I just don't see it happening. But again, jury's in the middle, not me. And I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't have a client in the case. Daryl, can they get um, an impartial jury in Boston? I mean, this thing is uh, big, big news there. It's a big there are people that There are people that say they live under a rock. There are people that really want to be on a jury. And so when there's that person, he or she says, Clearly, I've heard about this, but I would certainly listen to the evidence or the lack of evidence, and I would vote to acquit or vote to convict, depending on the evidence or the lack of evidence. I am fair and impartial, and that's the way I'll be. And there are a lot of people that truly want to be on a jury, and this jury, even more people, because the more it goes, the more publicity it gets. And who knows, they may even let me write a book, or they may do a story, and I may be the featured juror. And it it takes on a life of its own. Uh, True Virgo wants to know, will STS be covering this case uh, for the first time ever? What I think April is a crazy month. We have Chad Daybell kicking off uh, what I'm asking. There we go. Look at this. Look at the COE so fast. It, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, the STS main channel. That is best guess. Get the lingo right. Uh, COE. This is branding. It's called marketing. See STS best guess will air the Chad Daybell trial starting day one, um, and that is next week. And then April 16th, Best Trials, STS Best Trials will have the Karen Reed case. We are going to air the Karen Reed case, assuming that we can get uh, 
a hold of that pool camera, which we will be able to. So we'll be airing that. Uh, these are the questions, and I'm circling my way back to Melanie. I promise about the hearing today, but to Megan here from Sharon Curland. Uh, he was found, meaning John O'Keefe, with grass under him. So what time did the snow start? And what time did she drop him off, supposedly? So these are all excellent questions to ask, right? Yeah. I mean, this would be a great question. There was a big snowstorm that night. How do you answer a question like this where there was allegedly snow beneath him? Uh, that means he'd have to have been placed there logically before the snow started falling. Yeah, you have an expert on the weather come in and testify <laughs> as to what the weather was. When did it start to snow? How much snow accumulation could there have been? Um, but did they have an exact measurement of how much snow was under him? Was it under his legs? Was it under his whole body? Did it get there after they found him and possibly moved him? Um, you know, these are good questions. I don't know how much of the case would actually hinge on it, but it definitely a great question whether or not he's lying on top a pile of snow or mm -hmm. if he's on, you know, a very thin layer. I think that's definitely some evidence that would support one position or the other more so in this case. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, so, Melanie, I, I think I did see a Boston Globe headline saying that the judge define, uh, denied the defense motion, which is an error. Um, because you watched this entire hearing yeah. this morning and uh, there wrong. has <laughs> the Boston Globe, you're you're wrong. I'm um, sorry about that. Oh, no. um, so tell us, I mean, what what is, you know, you, you were telling me a little bit before going on there that there's going to be a buffer zone. Can you mm -hmm. expound, uh, expound on that? And they're also saying this trial could last up to six weeks. That's going to yeah. be some crazy uh, theater, uh, jurisprudence theater, right. if you will. But um. What about this buffer zone? Well, uh, the, the Commonwealth has made a motion for a buffer zone in accordance with their no picketing law in Massachusetts. So what they're asking the judge to grant, and this was not discussed today at the hearing. So if anybody watched the hearing, don't think you missed this because this was filed uh, today and we have a copy of it. They're asking for a 500 foot buffer zone that nobody is allowed within around the courthouse during the trial. They are asking to ban all buttons, T-shirts, uh, signs, and anything else in favor of either side during this trial. And they're also oddly asking for a ban on law enforcement uniforms for any law enforcement witnesses or even just courtroom observers who come into the courthouse. They do not want them wearing their police uniforms or law enforcement uniforms or patches. So the judge has not ruled on this. This is something that was just filed today. But uh, I say free speech, number one. And number two, 500 feet is more than the length of a football field and a half. So what's up with that, Massachusetts? I don't know. I guess you can ask for whatever you want. Doesn't mean the judge is going to grant it. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Um, Daryl Cohn, have you ever heard of, I, I assume um, they're not asking, they're just asking, um, Melanie for police officers. I assume they are not asking for like bailiffs to be in plain clothes. Correct? No, any law enforcement who want to sit in the courtroom and watch or who are witnesses in the case or parties to the case. There are no Dar parties, witnesses. Daryl, you've been around the block. Have you ever heard of this? The answer is no, and it's spelled N O. Quite frankly, when I was a prosecutor, whether it was Miami or Atlanta, cases I've defended. You always want your police officer to look the part that he or she should play. If you had a narcotics agent, you uh, as a male, you didn't want him to have short, closely cropped hair and look good. You wanted him or her to look like a slob, to look like somebody who the defense would have related to before they got busted. So, no, it's, in my view, totally inappropriate and 500 feet. Seriously, I'd love to be able to hit a home run that long, that far. <laughs> well, half that far. But no, I've not heard of that. I am. I would be surprised if the judge granted all of that. But as pointed out, if you don't ask, you don't get. And to have no buttons, I get that. But you also have people that are so entrenched on both sides. Yes, he did. No, she didn't. He didn't die. By her hand, it was a frame from Framingham. Who knows? This is just crazy. It's it's a reality show in the courtroom almost that's taken on a life of its own, and the court is going to have to gavel down a lot. 
Um, I was looking at another story by a local Boston uh, TV station. It read this. I'm paraphrasing here, but murder suspect Karen Reeve arrived uh, at court Tuesday, greeted by a chanting crowd, holding signs, free Karen uh, at the Massachusetts courthouse today. Megan Sachs. I mean, we saw things similar to this, similar um, if you go back to Michael Jackson, if you go back to OJ. But um, she's become sort of this cult of personality. Mm -hmm. Is it be? What is it like? What is behind this? That's what I want. I guess my bigger question is, if I wasn't hosting a true crime show, I don't know that I would have the energy with three children and doing other things and, you know, hoping that I have some semblance of a life out there that I would have the energy to put this into um, a trial. So who are these people and why are they so passionate? Well, it's interesting I, that you as I insult everyone in Boston. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> everyone yeah, you, that. <laughs> you better you better hope people are showing up at your book signing. You know? Hummingbird um, books, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know about the Manhattan one so I could come. But anyway, I'm gonna um, let you know. Okay. Um, and there's there's gonna be Jersey too. But go ahead. I'll meet you. There. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so interestingly, you pointed to Michael Jackson and OJ. These are celebrity figures, right? So people are interested, but can they relate to celebrity figures? Are they identifying with them? Not really, right? We're just interested. We want to peer in. Something about this woman is relatable to people. You know, they feel like they've either been her or been in a position like hers or been on the other side of like a power control dynamic where they are the small guy, again, the David B. Goliath. So I think that what makes people so invested in her is because they could be her. They could be someone like her. So I think she's relatable to the average person. And that's why the average person cares more about her than you would suspect. Um, what's... Also interesting to me as someone who's now teaching, I'm teaching media and crime right now, and we see these cases, and I literally just taught my class about how these cases are so rare. They're the celebrated cases. They're less than 1% of all trials, and uh, you know, trials only represent a small percentage of how cases are resolved anyway, and yet this case and others like it have the potential to influence what everyone in society thinks about our justice system. And I think that's really powerful here. Uh, Megan, by the way, is there hope for the future? How are your students? Do they pay attention for more than three <laughs> seconds or are they glued to their phones? It's both. They're multitaskers. <laughs> you have to yell at them. To, you have to yell at them to put their phones down or you can't do that in college. I start with a fear tactic like early on. So I kind of start with, you know, if you come late to class, if you're on your phones, I'm going to shame you. I'm going to quiz you on the spot, that kind of thing, okay. um, which sometimes works out and sometimes does not. The phone thing does uh, drive me crazy, but I will say most of my students are pretty respectful or good about hiding it. I tell my children I'm going to saw their arms off if they're not paying attention when I'm speaking to them. And that seems to not work. So yeah. I'm kidding, by the way. I'm kidding. No. I don't say that. See, I, I don't understand why you just don't say show them the phone. It disappears and say, my name is actually Houdini. And if I see the phone, it's going to disappear. And whether or not you ever find it again depends on your grade. hundred percent. There you 100%. go. It's a challenge. It's like going up a down escalator, trying to keep these kids on <laughs> task. But, uh, Nina Stanek here. Uh, by the way, there's a comment from Peace Faith, but I want to leave this comment up. Melanie is amazing. She keeps to the documents. I also only see only see hostility from the prosecution side. Then James Lynch says the facts prove Karen was framed. I'm very interested to see. I'll be honest. I have not studied this case the way most people have studied it. I have followed it and tried to keep up on it. But it's also, um, I'm just not that smart. And there's so many twists and turns it's hard for me to keep up with it. But um, Melanie, to you from Nina here, Commonwealth motion says surveillance uh, is missing. Karen arriving at John's house, only leaving. His niece said Karen had access to the camera app. Um, yeah. Go talk ahead. to us about this. Okay. I think she's uh, referring to the ring footage from the driveway of John O'Keefe's officer, John O'Keefe's house. And I'm going to call him officer John O'Keefe because everyone in court never addresses him as Officer John O'Keefe. Mm. They don't do it in their papers. They don't do it in court. It personally offends me. He mm. is also a police officer. The ring doorbell footage from his driveway, there was a camera there that captured Karen leaving in the morning to go look for him where she bumps into the other car. 
and uh, defense is saying that's where she cracks her taillight. They're saying they're, the video from her arriving home that night is missing. And like your viewer pointed out, she said um, that that is missing and the Commonwealth says that Karen's the only one who had access to the Ring app. Well, you know who else had access to the Ring app? The lead investigator on the case, Trooper Michael Proctor, who is being investigated by Internal Affairs right now and is also being investigated by the feds because he's the one who took possession of Officer Don O'Keefe's phone from the scene and had it in his possession for uh, an undetermined period of time before turning it into evidence. So, and, and that's it. You just brought up a huge, uh, a huge, the, yeah. You just brought up a huge player in the in all this who missed, is Mister Proctor. Um, what do we know exactly what they're investigating um, about him specifically? They did say Massachusetts State Police has revealed that it is with regard to the Karen Reed case. At first, they did not say why they were investigating him. And, and he, that's it, the internal affairs part that I'm talking about. The federal investigation, we don't know who the target of that investigation is. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's a there, there is a lot of, you know, I have moments where I say to myself, she did it. And then I have moments where I say to myself, I think she was framed. And it's, it's one of these cases where, um, you know, Everyone is so tribal, right? Everyone's got to pick a side, but I try to be open-minded. Um, at the end of the day, um, no conspiracy, in my opinion, just really good defense lawyers. That's another way to look at it. COE, um, what does Carm think? She thinks that I should shave. That's what she keeps telling me. She's <laughs> like, I hate my, she says my beard is getting too white and she hates it. But she honestly, Carm hasn't really followed this case um, too closely Daryl Cohen, this is a question that has come up a lot as we kind of deconstruct this in an odd way today. But from Steph Z, cardio dance, she's got to be in good shape. How do you explain microscopic pieces of tail light found on his clothes? Again, bad fact for the defense. Interesting piece of evidence. Daryl Cohen. Bad fact or a good fact, whether or not you're from the prosecution side or you're from the defense side. Each side believes what they believe and the facts and the evidence will come out in the trial if it doesn't end up destroyed before the trial. Not the evidence, but the trial itself. Hmm. It's yeah. predictably unpredictable. Um, this is an interesting comment. Annie K is always has interesting comments uh, and she's in the chat once again. This is for Megan, I think, um, and she's teaching the media class. Please address our desire for a more interesting story, which may influence the outcome versus finding out what really happened. And this is a great point because, look, defense attorneys at the end of the day are not that much different than what I did for a living, which is being a storyteller, being a reporter, being a media guy. They get paid a lot more and I should have done that. But um, but they they have to create a narrative. Um, is there something about this that people do want? a very compelling story. Um, and so they kind of go down these potential rabbit holes or maybe not rabbit holes. Oh, absolutely. We, we, we want an interesting story. We like salacious stories. It's normal. It's natural. Um, the media understands that they understand what we want, which is why they publicize cases that might be very rare, but not normal. So our perceptions of, you know, the criminal justice system are definitely, you don't really mirror reality unless you know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but it's both. It's both that we want it and that the media wants to serve it to us, um, to satisfy us. And a good story goes a long way. And so does a good crime. If it bleeds, it leads. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. You can't change human curiosity either. Um I talk about in my class all the time. Why are you know, why don't we hear more about the cases that are more normal? You know, the second or third layer of cases that are felonies that are settled in the courts um, whereby people are plea bargaining. And here's what really happens. It's because that there's no interesting story behind that. Right. Um, there's nothing we can pull apart or talk about at the water cooler, talk about with our friends, um, things of that nature. There's no real book club around those stories. You know, it's not pop culture. So, yeah, we we definitely seek out a good and interesting story. And it's part, honestly, it's part of relieving monotony of daily life. We have that kind of curiosity and we we do want that. A hundred percent. And uh, Netflix has enforced that in all of us. Uh 
We got a super chat here from uh, Kristen. Melanie Little, thanks for all that you do and not being a cupcake. Karen Reed said she saw John Officer John O'Keefe, and I'm with Melanie on that. Go into the house. If that's true, I hit him doesn't make sense. Your thoughts? It's the one thing that bothers me. If you're, if you're, so many things bother me about this case. That is uh, one of the least of them. Uh, I'd like to go back to the clothes if we could, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, well, I want to get back to You know, it. going along the, uh, the, the sense of like, you could never believe that people could conspire to cover this up, right? So you would never believe that he went in the house, something happened in there, and then he was dragged out onto the front lawn and just left there. You could never believe that. You couldn't wrap your head around that, right? So she wakes up the next morning. She's freaking out. He's not home. She is with two of John's friends who may have, you know, planted something in her head. And she goes there and she freaks out and he's laying where she saw him get out of the car. And she's like, I hit him. I hit him because you just can't wrap your head around anything else nefarious that could have happened. I, I, that's what I think. And I also think you have to take that from where it comes because the people who said that she said I hit him are people who, uh, whose credibility may be an issue here. So People say things too with uh, I mean, just with shock, with confusion. She was drinking very heavily. Uh, uh, there's so many factors that play into confusion and questioning in a time like, wow, could I have possibly done this? Right. Mm -hmm. Like memory recall, things of that nature. Yeah. We just did a missing, a young missing man, Riley Strain, 22 years old, yep. goes out, got very drunk. He ended up in the river and people right. don't know how or why he ended up there, but obviously he was disoriented. Uh, mm -hmm. So it does, it does happen. That was a horrific outcome yeah. um, from Courtney H here. Uh, Joel and I, I, Melanie, I want to get back to you about the clothing in one second. Could you ask the panel, Daryl Cohen, if they've noticed that the judge doesn't seem to like the defense very much and seems annoyed with this case. Uh, the judge has also made some headlines, but today uh, in, in the hearing, the defense basically came out and said that they want the state. And this has been going on the last couple of hearings. The, the defense wants the state handing over more docs. And there, there's, I guess, what I would describe as some games gamesmanship with uh, the state saying that they're still waiting on mitochondrial DNA testing of a hair sample found on the back of Karen Reed's SUV before completing its obligations. And back and forth, this tennis match goes as the judge is sitting there. Um, but, Dara, what's your experience in the past? Did judges... Obviously, they're supposed to be completely impartial and just overseeing the trial. But do, do judges quietly get um, emotions regarding one side or the other? And do you think this judge has any animus towards the defense at all? Well, Joel, number one, most judges are prosecution oriented. There are a few that are not. So many judges are former prosecutors. But having said that, it doesn't really matter. Judges look at the people in front of them. If the defense or the prosecution is nice, the judge is, tends to be leaning a little more toward him or her. If the people are not nice, if they're sarcastic, if they're inappropriate in the judge's opinion, then they lean, the judge leans away from them. And after a period of time, it becomes obvious. Judges are nothing more and nothing less than people with a robe on. And so though they deserve all the deference they get, they still have prejudices and they still believe what they believe. And depending on what their background is, they look at the various cases and the various participants or parties to and in the case and see how they think those people are believing. Are believable. Judges look at body language. Judges pay attention to facial expressions. Judges pay attention to the people who lean over and talk. They notice these things, and that plays a part, in my view, in how they rule from time to time, because sometimes the ruling could be either way. But if it's one way or the other, and it's so close, a judge is going to rule in the way he or she believes that he likes or dislikes the people because it may not make a difference as far as the law is concerned but it does make a difference in how the case proceeds or doesn't proceed uh as it um pertains to a uh you know a, consp a vast conspiracy here uh Kristen says i disagree think about the ellen greenberg case that's a case that troubles a lot of people including myself a young teacher uh, in the suburbs of Philadelphia in Maniunk, and she is stabbed uh, 20 times, but two of them were post-mortem. Uh, 
10 of them to the back of her head and neck. And uh, she was, she had a fiance at the time. And that fiance uh, came from a very powerful family. I'll say the distinction there is very few people were involved. If there was a conspiracy uh, in this case, it would have to be a lot of individuals but again, this guy Proctor is being investigated right now as a lead investigator. So, Megan, just going back as I work backwards the other way now, um, what do you think about this conspiracy notion? I mean, would it be possible to get all these people within Canton, Massachusetts and others potentially to go along with this theory, to go along with this conspiracy? Yeah, this is a massive conspiracy we're talking about. And, uh, you know, as I've covered, as Amy and I have covered in our show with other cases, most conspiracies of even two or more people fall apart because somebody talks, somebody cracks, somebody has guilt, somebody tells a girlfriend something, somebody's inebriated. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why someone will crack. And that's why cases, uh, crimes involving more than one person are usually easier um, to to crack open this conspiracy is so we're talking about so many people i think people on both law enforcement um civilians uh other responders it would be a, a stretch it would be very hard for this many people i think to keep a conspiracy together without someone cracking which doesn't mean by the way that someone won't crack at some point here um we don't know i think there's also the idea what maybe some people haven't realized here is that people might be unwittingly involved in this conspiracy, right? The first responder who said that Karen said, I hit him. Uh, maybe that person is relating what they heard or what they thought they heard, but they're not part of a conspiracy. They're just kind of getting lumped in. So I think we're assuming that everyone here is a bad actor and that might not be the truth, but assuming that there's more than three or four is very complicated. And hard uh, to keep. To say, and, and let me jump in, Joel, just for a second. Sometimes, sometimes it's not necessarily a conspiracy that people don't crack, but in a conversation that's overheard, right. they may have dropped. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that, and they don't realize they shouldn't have said that it's until late. it comes out later. So, I think, and I agree, this conspiracy, if it exists. They all deserve their SAG cards and they should get Oscars and Emmys because they've learned their copy very well. They've got the script and they've done it well. I just think it's too much to say that all of these people are involved in a mega conspiracy. Daryl Cohen, please forward your uh, hate mail to me so I can take joy in reading it. It'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> Patricia Siebold or Seibold. Uh, Joel, great panel. Love to the classiest, best attorney, Melanie. She is massively intelligent and pretty. Can't deny Aww. that. We, lo we love her wisdom and deep analysis of this case, followed by this. Come on, Joel. Let Melanie talk. <laughs> she knows all the dirt. Uh, Melanie, is she innocent or guilty? No. Um, back to the clothing for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's not this huge conspiracy. All of these people are related. They're family. Yeah. They're family. You've got the 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 family that owns the house. Okay, he's mm -hmm. a Boston police officer. Mm -hmm. uh, she's her sister. The wife's sister is this Jen McCabe. Her husband is Matt McCabe. Then on the Albert side, you have Kevin Albert, who's with the Canton PD. Um, Brian Albert is with the Boston PD. And then their brother, Chris, is a politician in town. His wife, Julie, and he have a son named Colin, who everyone swears wasn't in the house, but maybe he was. He also drives a Ford Edge that the plow driver saw a Ford Edge parked in front of the house where the body was found. There, it's not that many people. And when all of them are related and or working in the same police departments that are involved in this investigation and the lead investigator... His mother said that the Albert family was like their second family. It's like, you know, like, look at them. All right. The mafia doesn't exist. But if it did exist, they were able to keep a lot of secrets. Right. So I just when people say it's this huge conspiracy, would you lie to save a, a member of your family? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe something happened inside the house. You know, maybe somebody didn't murder him. It could have been an accident. But where's the evidence that she hit him with her car? There are no injuries below the neck to his body. No injuries below the neck, except for 
what looks like a dog attack to the right arm, the mm. forearm. I had a dog expert on my channel. <laughs> He's like, those are absolutely dog bites. Interesting. And some boxer fractures to his right knuckles. There are no below the neck injuries. So how did a car hit him? So, so what do you make of these microscopic pieces of taillight? Is that, is that, and oh, I, again, I'm asking no. this from a place of ignorance. Is that no. part of the conspiracy? First is of all, I think you might find that polycarbonate does not shatter into microscopic pieces. Number two, you might find out that the, the, the right. pieces of taillight at the scene were not found until after Trooper Proctor drove 40 miles, had the car towed back 40 miles. They were discovered 10 hours wow. later on top of the snow after 12 more inches of snow fell. He also took possession of Officer John O'Keefe's clothes and did not log them into evidence for weeks. The chain of custody issues here alone are enough reasonable doubt to drive a truck through. So riddle me that. <laughs> I mean, this this is, again, this is why it, it becomes, I'm not following this for full disclosure the way most of the people who are following this are following it. But um, just hearing Melanie talk, again, first of all, anytime an attorney says anything, I've said this before in the show, I'm like, oh yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, Melanie is just speaking facts here. Um, I thought there were injuries below the neck. I never knew this until this very moment that there were absolutely no injuries uh, below the neck. Daryl, you seem a more skeptical. Let's put it that way. How come? Because the more people involved in in a case, a conspiracy, the more likely a leak one way or the other. And having known that it's all family, families fight, husband yeah. and wives fight. And when they fight, they utter words that they mean and sometimes don't mean, and many times don't want anybody to hear. So I am convinced, not that she's guilty, not that she's innocent, not that she's not guilty, but I'm convinced that if there is a conspiracy, they are doing, as I previously mentioned, a wonderful job of conspiring. And maybe they're perspiring as they conspire, but this is Boston and it's cold. So I don't know. It's <laughs> There's too much here. This is not a perfect case. And these are cases we love. These are cases we love to comment on. These are cases we love to watch as they're being tried because they are like a soap opera that's unscripted. So it's unscripted TV in a courtroom before his or her honor. Uh, Megan, there's a comment in here, and I'm going to hop back uh, to Daryl and then over to Melanie. I have to let her talk. I'm going to get yelled at. But Claudia here says uh, the trial will tell the truth. Um, do we all have to take that as sort of. Uh, a sacred part of America, the American fabric that whatever result or verdict these jurors come to, that has to be the correct verdict. No, we don't have to accept that, but we, we don't have to accept that in what we believe, but legally we have to accept that what the jury decides they decide. And then there's an appeals process, right? But appeals prevailing on appeals is not as easy as maybe some people might think it is. Um, it's actually quite challenging. So uh, I, I think one of the nice things about the last 15 years of research also in our area has exposed how many wrongful convictions there actually are and all the processes that lead to them. So no, you don't have to accept that that's the truth. Um, but a trial at least allows you to hear all of the evidence you know, we're talking about evidence now, and there's a lot out in this case because of all the motions and, and things, you know, there's a lot ahead of this case, but at the trial, you'll get everything. It'll be really hard though, because I think this trial also, I, I'm not an attorney, but I think there's a lot of going to be a lot of battle of the experts. And when it comes to battle of the experts, it's not always who's the most credible expert, but it also can become, who do you believe? Who do you like more? Who do you identify with more? And I think that's going to be very, very challenging in this case, um, the battle of the experts. Um, By the way, I also think, uh, sorry, when you ask about the conspiracy, can this many people pe keep the conspiracy? And is it really that difficult? Yes, I think it would be that difficult. But the maybe the better question is, and the question, I mean, that pops into my head is, will one or two jurors believe that there's reasonable doubt? And that I think there's a lot of reasonable doubt here, <laughs> to be honest. I think Even just, if I think it, it can't be a mass conspiracy, I still see a lot of reasonable doubt. 
Yeah, I think just amongst us four, there's reasonable yeah. doubts. And then you add in uh, eight more jurors and, and we'll see what happens uh, to Melanie. Um, I have seen the analogy from the dog trainer about the wounds on his arm. Can you summarize the results for us? Uh, the first of all, the, the the family had a German Shepherd for nine years uh, that when the defense went to get the town animal control records, they were told by the homeowners that they all of a sudden rehomed their dog out of state. So the dog is missing. The dog's DNA could never be tested. Uh, the dog also bit two people within close proximity to this event happening. So there are those records which were lied about, which were only gathered from the, the uh, animal control department of Canton. So the dog is gone. Um, the expert that I had, who's a canine dog trainer, he's been around and training dogs to bite for more than 30 years. And he grew up around canine dogs, said that the injuries, when I showed him the photo, and he showed us videos of, of dogs that they train to bite, specifically lock and pull because the person pulls their arm away and the dog's incisors or teeth pull down. So it becomes like these lacerations, just like we see in the autopsy photo. I don't know if you've seen the autopsy photo. You know, the other thing is that the medical examiner referred to what are clearly lacerations and we don't need a medical degree to say that as abrasions. So... Uh, she also said that she wasn't really qualified to say where those injuries came from, but she specifically said they did not come from a fight, which I found to be bizarre. I've never seen that in an autopsy report where they say the injuries were not caused by something. They usually will say they are consistent with a mm. car accident, which she also did not say. But um, she also that, failed her accreditation exam once or twice. So well, that. that's uh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, do you, do you think that that's part of a conspiracy on the flip side, I guess, on the state side? No, I mean, I don't think it's even part of a conspiracy. But if there were troopers standing over her while she's doing the autopsy and she's not that experienced and they say, we Got need it. to know that you think there was no fight involved here. Can you put right. that in the report? I, mean, mm. I don't think that everyone here has to be part of the conspiracy. I also know that a number of these witnesses who are in the family and in the house he also lied about who was in the house, didn't even interview them for seven to 10 months after the incident, testified in front of the federal grand jury. So we don't really know if anybody flipped. You know, maybe that will come out. Right. Um, we have to see. We don't know yet. So there's yeah. just so much here. Like, we cannot cover this in a one hour show. 100% not. Uh, Nancy, Joe M., but we can try to cover some. Um, <laughs> does anyone know who? Uh, Melanie, or what? We talked about this, uh, the investigation into Officer Proctor and the FBI investigation, but do we know what the um, catalyst for this was? No, we don't know. We don't know whether they were investigating Michael Marcy's office. We do know that Michael Marcy knew there was an investigation um, a, a long time before it was made public, sometime in maybe May of 2023. Like that's when the grand jury was convened. So they may have been investigating a different case or that office or some other public officials and stumbled on this with wiretaps or we don't really know has not been revealed. So in the in the investigating that you've done, let me phrase it that way. Mm -hmm. And the documents that you've looked at, in your opinion, are Officer John O'Keefe's injuries consistent with being hit by a car or not at all? Absolutely. 100% no. I handled car accidents in addition to suing the Catholic Church for their survivors of clergy sex abuse. Hundreds and thousands of car accidents. No. 100% no. Interesting. Um, Daryl, back to you on this. Um, the judge today in this hearing um, noted that the defense, the defense here, failed to file a promised motion alleging, quote unquote, egregious government misconduct. Uh, in response, the defense said that they, quote unquote, made a dis uh, strategic decision now not to file that motion. So the defense was going to file a motion about egregious um, government conduct and now say they are not going to file it. What is going on there between state, the state and the defense? Is this pure gamesmanship or is it something more? The defense, in my view, is saying we are looking to the court of public opinion. The fact that we said we're going to do it. 
means everything because that got us the publicity that got us what we're looking for but the fact that we didn't do it we really don't want to hurt anybody they succeeded in doing exactly what they wanted to do they obviously did not have enough of the judge to handle the case in that way as far as that motion was concerned but they had enough to light a fire and when there's a fire there's usually smoke and people say when there's smoke there's a fire but in this case i think there's more fire than the fire creating smoke and people wanting to hear it. So this is just gamesmanship in my view and not unacceptable, not acceptable. It's just the way that the court is watching this and the way the lawyers want to get involved and they're trying their best to have Karen Reed acquitted before she ever goes before a jury. They want that jury to be predisposed to say not guilty. Hmm. And that's what uh, good defense lawyers do. Yeah. And this is uh, yeah, going to get you as our good friend, Phil Waters, every Friday, America's most respected detective says this is going to get their panties in a wad uh, from bossy Texas chick with how much everyone can't stand Karen's. I just don't see how she gets so much support. <laughs> she is the face of Karen and her dang name is even Karen. LOL. Uh, Melanie, I'm just curious because in the one or two show, I think we only did one show on this granted, uh, two big personalities in this case came on the show that time and it uh, stirred a lot of um, discussion. Let's put it that way. Uh, that's a, uh, a euphemism for other things, but I'm curious, Melanie, um, what kind of support are you getting from one side and flack from the other as you go down your YouTube journey here on this story? Oh, me personally, I've been accused of um, going on vacation with the defense attorney recently. That's a new Twitter thing that they've accused me. They think I'm being paid by the defense to make my YouTube videos, that I'm part of a PR team that is absolutely 100% paid to say this and that everything I say is lies. I mean, Twitter is a cesspool of I don't even know like what goes on there because I don't use Twitter. I, I'll go With on all it for due breaking respect, news. It's but, now X. It's now uh, X. Oh, I know. I'm always going to call it Twitter, though, darling. I just can't. <laughs> I just can't get on board with the name change. Uh, and then the people who are from, you know, Norfolk County that have rallied uh, with me, I say, Karen, like Megan said before, the reason I think that people are standing up for this case is because Karen, you, Karen Reed could be you or me or my sister or your sister. Karen Reed could be any one of us. You know, and if this kind of thing can happen to Karen Reed, listen, she happens to have money to be able to defend this. Right. You know, Alan Jackson and his L.A. law firm are not cheap. They do not come cheap. These experts do not come cheap. And every time the judge wants them to fly in for a 10 minute hearing, like this hearing was 10 minutes today, maybe 15. Um, they've raised money for her defense fund. But if she did not have the resources to defend herself, this would be a very different situation. She'd be sitting in a jail cell, uh, you know, in Norfolk County is for two years because she was able to post an $80,000 bond. That's why she's out. So. It's it's a scary thought, I think, for a lot of people to wrap their head around. And that's why she has support. It's not people think the protesters are being paid also. Who's paying them? <laughs> like somebody said there was a casting call for protesters. Like like the insanity <laughs> that's out there is just mind boggling. Um, her father, William Reed, today said it's been a hell. 26 months. It's been a hell. And we have to keep going on, uh, he said. But, you know. Uh, we, we've seen this before. By the way, uh, Jennifer Jansen says New York City is imploding. So don't worry, Boston. Uh, you've got company with New York City. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's a great point. You know, we've seen in the past people with financial resources, they just generally, uh, if we're going to be honest about it, get better defenses. Um, back to Melanie real quick on this one from Sharon Curland. He has only, he also only had one sneaker on. The other sneaker was found in a driveway, in the driveway. So is that significant in being hit by a car or not? It appears that you don't think so. Not a low speed motor vehicle accident. At one point, the defense was saying that he, she hit him going 27 miles an hour in reverse. Have you ever tried to do 27 miles an hour in reverse? It's virtually impossible. It, there was a light coating of snow. There were no tire tracks. Okay. There was also no crime scene photo take, photos taken. There was no crime scene. The crime scene was not secured. No crime scene tape. That sneaker wasn't found until a couple of days later. Uh, so the short answer is no. And, and Megan, today... Um, 
you know, that was mentioned that this trial could last six weeks. I mean, all kidding aside, this could be a very potentially volatile situation outside the courthouse, inside the courthouse, too. But um, I could see this devolving into protests and possibly into some violence. Am I being over dramatic or, uh, you know, people getting really heated about this? People are heated. And I do think it's a very real possibility that we're going to see violence surrounding this case outside um, just such strong divisions. Um it's just eliciting such strong emotions from people. And there's so many people that are going to be attending this trial. So many people are going to be outside. Um, they're going to be, they are going to be chanting. They're going to have signs. There's going to be tensions running high. So do I think everyone's going to be, you know, beating each other up in the streets? No, but I definitely predict there'll be some violent outbursts surrounding the case outside. And it's a long time. <laughs> Six weeks is a long trial. Although I'm, I'm not surprised that the prediction was that long. Um, Nina Stanek and Melanie, I don't know if you're willing to do this, but it's her asking the question, not me. If you were the prosecutor, what would you do or have done? Uh, I don't know at what point, but initially what I would have not done was told the media that there was an actual ring doorbell video of Karen hitting John with her car because that does not exist. And that was the those were the immediate media reports that came out and are still out there. Um, so. I think a lot of people who don't know a lot about this case remember those initial Boston CBS reports. And, they, you know, the Daily Mail picked it up. You know how this stuff goes, like wildfire, same day. It's still out there. Mm -hmm. Investigators say they have video of Karen Reed hitting John with her car. Uh, the ma the matriarch of the show has appeared, Carmela Waldman, my dear mother. I am watching and learning, and you're learning from the best. You've got Megan, Daryl, and Melanie here. And... Uh, you know, there's certain women, I will be completely honest, that scare me. Uh, my mother is number one. My wife is number two. May, they compete neck and neck. Black Widow is up there from the Republic of Ireland. Um, and now Melanie Little. She just seems like <laughs> the kind of person that is going to take absolutely no crap from anyone. And uh, so she's in that category now, but I like it. Uh, Melissa Edge here says, Turtle Boy and Melanie Little have the facts. Nobody knows this case better. Um, there is an elephant in the room because TB was on this show and uh, he's had a very difficult time, obviously, um, uh, was sent to jail uh, as part of this case and other factors. But I just want to say to uh, Turtle Boy that no matter this case aside, uh, I respect that you've, you know, you've you've followed this story as a journalist and uh, we're going to follow this case and uh, down the road. Uh, We'll get you back on. I'm just not going to do it with Wendy Murphy because I need to be able to have people speak and it's never going to happen if the two of them are on the show at one time. But uh, we will do that. Blackwood Door says to buy my mother a membership. And just in case you're wondering, Carm is going to be at the book signing in Beantown, May 16th, Hummingbird Books, 7.30 p.m. She will even curse for you in a custom inscription uh if you would like <laughs> if you're there in person i'll make sure it happens um here's a question megan it's a very simple question mm -hmm. why would the police want to frame her and i think that's actually the great question here like <laughs> why would all these people yes. want to frame her and why did it you know i i don't know that they wanted to frame her uh if i have to play devil's advocate here because i i can't say for sure i would say it didn't start out you know there was no intention to um, murder someone and frame another person, but perhaps it evolved from an idea of, oops, an accident or a fight or something happened here. Unintended. We have to fix it. There's an obvious scapegoat. Let's make it as minimal as possible. You know, maybe she hit him with a car, but it was an accident. But I think it kind of started maybe lower stakes. I, I want to say there's no low stake frame job, so don't get me wrong, but lower stakes. But because it's taken on a life of its own here. The stakes have been upped and things are now at the next level. But I don't, if I had to guess, I wouldn't guess from the very beginning, there was this malicious thought, like we're going to hurt this person. We're going to frame this other person. That's not what I think actually happened in the case. Uh, by the way, Carm by nature, being a Holocaust survivor, my dear mother is extremely paranoid. So it would not surprise me. I'll talk to her about this afterwards. It would not surprise me in the least to hear her say that uh, 
she believes that she was framed. That would not surprise me at all. Uh, so yeah. I'll have to ask Carm and see what she says. La Mesa, a uh, friend of the show here. Uh, do you think the ever increasing, we talked about this a little bit, Megan, I'm going to toss this right back to you. Okay. Uh, do you think the ever in increasing distrust of police and law enforcement in general, we've seen defund the police and all that uh, can fan the flames. I feel Karen Reed is almost forgotten uh, and people are mad and suspicious of police departments, especially the Boston PD. Yeah, I think that's what uh, that was. What is a huge part of the support for Karen Reed and the outrage? I, it's a very bad time, unfortunately, between communities and police right now. It's something I talk about in my classes, you know, how we got here, but also how we're going to fix this problem, because it's it's huge and it's on the forefront of criminal justice policy for the next you know, 15 years or so, um, we have to restore relations between police and communities. But again, public confidence, unfortunately, in the police is, I, want, I won't say it's an all-time low, but it's low. Uh, it's not a good situation right now. And I definitely think mistrust and distrust of the police is facilitating um, this this story. And it has kind of, it's the current, it's the back backstory here. Uh, Melanie from Rosemary Romero, is it true that the people in the home did not know John O'Keefe or Karen Reed, Officer John O'Keefe? Um, and if so, uh, do we think that maybe just uh, there was just some blood, bad blood that spilled out and there was a fight of some sort? Uh, Officer John O'Keefe was friends with the people in the house. He had been friends with Jen McCabe, who was um, the homeowner's sister-in-law, or I guess he and his wife owned the home. It's his sister. Jen McCabe had been friends with Officer Donald Key for at least 10 years. She's the one who invited them to the house. Karen didn't want to go in, so she didn't go in. Um, you know, there's been some speculation that there's some beef between Officer O'Keefe and uh, one of the younger people who may or may not have been in the house, that he had thrown beer cans on his lawn, that he may have reported him for something having to do with um, illegal activity. Um, so there was some beef there. I, I, you know, they did know him. Uh, we're going to get back to this Not question. From the, thank you. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. Uh, we're going to get back to this question in one moment. But um, Daryl Cohen, from an attorney's perspective, especially a defense attorney's perspective, this trial was actually supposed to start on uh, March 12th. Now I believe it is April 16th. And that is because just a couple of weeks before the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts turned over what is described as a voluminous pile of records on the case. Why would that happen so late in, you know, the discovery process, so close to the trial date, and then ultimately the trial date had to be postponed? To get into their heads is difficult. Sometimes there's a drop of evidence. And when I say a drop, not a tiny bit, but a whole lot of drops here, there, and everywhere that makes up a giant can at the last minute and everybody has to have the right and the time to go through it, to see the veracity of it, see whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's believable, whether it's credible. So that doesn't particularly bother me. It bothers me that this case has become much larger than life. And that's a concern because every case deserves its day in court, whether it ends up in a plea, whether it ends up in a dismissal, a verdict of guilty, a verdict of not guilty. But here we have people that are on both sides without having heard all of the evidence, the good or the bad. They know pieces of evidence. He was a good guy. He was a bad guy. She ran over him. She didn't run over him. She might have run over him. She admitted she did. No, she didn't. She asked. All of these things have to be taken in context. And right now, everything we're hearing is basically out of context. And that's why when the time comes, we're going to hear a lot of evidence and it'll be up to us and mostly the jury to extrapolate from that evidence what they believe. Is it accurate from the defense side, from the prosecution side? And let me say this. When we talk about a six-week trial, that is a defense love and a defense prosecution nightmare. Prosecutors, as a rule, believe in the KISS method. Keep it short, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Go straight to the point, get it over, get it done, and let the defense throw up the smoke. This is not happening here. And I think that bodes well, regardless of the evidence, bodes well for the defense. There you go, from a defense attorney. Uh, Sharon Curland here. 
Uh, by the way, you see this all laid out, the trial schedule for April 16th. If you have not subscribed to uh, COE, we should put that link up. Um, it's our best trials. We've got a best guest channel and then a best trials channel. And during uh, this and Chad Daybell, we are going to be doing uh, some live commentary. Tim Jansen, famed Tallahassee defense attorney. He was in Miami today for a case, and I met him for lunch. And uh, he's going to come on and do uh, commentary along with others. Hopefully we'll get uh, Melanie and Daryl and other attorneys uh, to come on, even Megan, uh, who's not an attorney, but we'll get her and Amy to come on uh, one day to do commentary as we go through the trial. Uh, that's what makes us a little different than some of the other uh, channels out there. We do live commentary, not every day, but during big days in the trial. But make sure that you please subscribe to the Best Trials channel. This is the best guest one in the COE. We'll get you that um, link in a moment. Uh, but to you, Melanie, so much talk about this Google search, 2.30 a.m., about how long it is to die in the cold. Seems very suspicious. For those who are unfamiliar, just kind of um, explain this and what you make of these searches. Uh, sure. Well, there has been a lot of chatter and there was a lot of fighting back and forth between the defense and the prosecution or the Commonwealth in this case about whether or not Jen McCabe's phone made a Google search quote, how long to die in cold, but she spelled it wrong. So it was Haas long to die in cold at 2.27 a.m., which was more than three hours before Officer John O'Keefe's body was found. The It has recently been confirmed that that search did indeed happen at 2.27 a.m. by a Quantico-trained FBI agent who analyzed the data in the federal investigation. So that is no longer in question. It's uncontroverted. Why would... I'm not even going to say Jen McCabe. Jen McCabe's phone, Google, how long to die in cold more than three hours before Officer John O'Keefe's body was found. It makes, make it make sense. It strains credulity. I just want to, sorry, I, I just wanted to that. add something, if that's all right, Melanie. Um, sure. Just because. COE, I'm sorry, one second. When I get home, my kids sorry. better know what credulity means and how to spell right. it. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Megan. Um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, I saw the same information about the expert who said, no, this search was made at 227 or 228 um, a.m. But I still think the prosecution is going to bring out its own expert and they're going to find someone pretty good, I would say, to say, well, here's why it actually is possible that this wasn't it didn't happen at this time. For every expert, there's usually a matching expert. And mm -hmm. I, I would be very surprised if they didn't find someone and then it'll come down to what are the jury you know, what does the jury believe? Um, obviously, that was very good for the defense, that finding. But I still think it's going to be a battle of experts. Um, as Melanie said, there's no way we're getting through this in one show or 20 <laughs> shows. But we're going to go a few more minutes and then uh, have to let uh, Melanie has five kids. She's got to get back to her kids at some point. Me, I'm trying to hide from them. Um, <laughs> Deborah, <laughs> Deborah Dannon Felser. That's a Dannon Felser. There we go. Uh, Daryl, why is the prosecutor getting away with lying so much? Goes to show a little bias here. His behavior is so slimy. Daryl, how would you respond to a comment such as this? If I were a prosecutor, I'd say I'm doing my job. I'm not lying. It might be the way I view the evidence or the lack of evidence. And I'm also, I would say as a prosecutor, even though I didn't believe it, not trying to influence anyone. The reality is prosecutors, just like defense lawyers, are trying to pre-make people decide toward a verdict of guilty, the, just the way the defense lawyers are trying to make people pre-decide to a verdict of not guilty. So the prosecutor is saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not lying. And oh, by the way, I'm not under oath. But if I was, I'd still say the same thing. This is a soap opera reincarnate. Uh, there are a few motions out there that are, as far as I know, still pending in terms of a decision. And this came up in last week's uh, hearing. Motion number one, uh, Melanie, it seeks records from the Massachusetts State Police. By the way, someone said this is not a conspiracy by the Canton Police, but by the State Police. And this motion seeks records from the Massachusetts State Police Internal Affairs about trooper michael proctor he was as we talked about the lead investigator now he's under internal investigation uh for potential violation of department policy i mean this seems extremely serious and extremely important melanie do we know where this stands in terms of the defense getting these records that they are asking for there was no opposition to that motion so they will be getting those records 
There we. This is why she scares me. It's nice easy, so right? <laughs> yeah. Motion number why two. They be getting the records. If you have nothing to hide as a prosecutor, you hide nothing. The more you provide, the better off you are, and the more credibility you have as a prosecutor trying to have a person convicted based upon the evidence that we are going to present as a prosecutor. And, I mean, Daryl, if the state was to resist uh, and not hand it over, that would obviously raise concern, right? What are you hiding? Why are you hiding this? In the same way, when you're in the courtroom and there's an objection, then the jury oftentimes, and at least in our minds as lawyers, says, why are they objecting? Why are they trying to keep this from us? We need to hear everything. So, yeah, as a prosecutor, you need to turn over everything, good or bad. And that's what the rules of evidence show. We have motions for that. Please give us everything, the good and the bad. And with all due respect to Clint Eastwood and the ugly. There we go. Um, Karn, by the way, we should do a book tour in Australia. Uh, we got a lot of Australian viewers and uh, Lily is one of them. Good day from, I can't do it. Uh, love TB and Melanie. Um, Megan, I mean, you've touched upon this, but why is, why are people in Australia uh, interested in this case? I, that always amazes me that there's literally a world down under and there are people there who are, and I saw it in the chat who said that we're going to wake up for this entire trial yeah. overnight to watch. Why? Yeah, there are just some cases that appeal to the world, which I always, um, I find very interesting as well. Um, there are cases that appeal to me that are decided in the UK because they're so, there's so much media surrounding them. They're so prolific. The implications are so far ranging. I mean, think about this. If, if, she's acquitted if Karen Reed is acquitted um it could be reasonable doubt but there could also just be the implication that she was framed by one of the most powerful institutions in our society and I just think that's huge and I think people in other countries recognize how big this issue is and you know it's hard to explain but there are certain cases that resonate with the world and this is one of them it it's an odd case for sure it's unique uh, I'll tell you what, uh, as I do another show on this, I'm like, I am actually going to sit down and watch this entire case gavel to gavel. And it's a good thing because we're going to have it on our channel um, yeah. r running around a lot during the day, taking care of things. But this trial, I'm definitely definitely going to be uh, glued to, uh, as I will be with uh, Chad Daybell, interested to see how that all plays out. Motion number two, Melanie, that's still kind of up in the air, is uh, they're seeking... Um, phone records from Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, and Kevin Albert from April Fools, April 1st, 2023 to the present. Brian Albert and Brian Higgins were reportedly inside Brian Albert's house on the night of Officer John O'Keefe's death. And Kevin Albert is Brian's brother and also a Canton police officer. Uh, what are they looking for here? These are uh, communications between the three of them right before they were to testify in front of the federal grand jury. So the argument is that Kevin Albert, who was a Canton police officer, inserted himself into this investigation. Once again, they were conflicted out of this investigation specifically because it happened at his brother's house. And then when the federal grand jury subpoenas went out, all of a sudden he started communicating again with uh, Brian Higgins, who is an ATF agent who was in the house the night of the incident. And uh, I think you said Brian Albert, right? His brother. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, going to their evidence of the potential third party culprit defense. And that motion, I believe, has also been granted. Um, from Susanna Mattingu, uh, the super chat. I love you guys to death. No pun intended. That's a tough <laughs> word for this kind of genre. I love shows like this. I less love shows about. D-E-A-D, -E I don't want to say kids, missing kids, off topic. I know possible to live. Well, we do those shows. We do a lot of different shows uh, on this channel. We are not a one trick pony. We, we cover, I'm a news guy. So I like to cover stories that are in the news. And, uh, you know, we were also trying to help uh, those um, searchers and see if we could uh, lend our platform to them. Uh, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we've got about 2 million views a month right now. So there are people all over uh, watching. And I wanted to make sure uh, we could do everything we could to try to help those uh, young kids. And there's, by the way, Sebastian Rogers is a story we did yesterday. That's a very curious case, a 15-year-old boy with autism.
who disappeared from his home. And uh, we're going to stay on that case as well. So we'll do a mix. Uh, I have not read this comment and we will, I promise, start to wrap in a moment from Aria Dakota, Grimaldi Lane in the UK. Uh, from the hearings I've seen, Karen Reed comes across as very cold. Shouldn't her attorneys be getting her to defrost her demeanor a bit. The jury doesn't hit, uh, like that attitude and it could be bad. Daryl Cohen, how important is it to talk to your client? Uh, we saw this in the Charlie Adelson case with uh, Donna Sue Adelson. When she was arrested, she was all kinds of out of control in the courtroom. How important is it for a uh, defense attorney like yourself to temper their client? Johnny Depp, Amber Heard. Remember that one? She looked mm -hmm. like this. She was condescending and pretentious. Half to two thirds of the way through, another stylist got to her and loosened her hair, loosened her up. It is of paramount importance. Excuse me, paramount. Excuse me, CBS. It is the most important thing you can do. A jury looks at these people every time a juror walks in. He or she will glance, directly look at. They will look at the body language. They will look at the facial expressions. They'll look at the way and the time that they're conferring with their attorneys. All of this is so important. She has to be on stage at every moment that she walks in that courtroom until the moment she walks out of the courtroom on stage. And if she perhaps runs into a would-be juror or a juror, even more important. So she's never off stage, has to be relaxed, has to look innocent at all times, whatever their decision as to what looking innocent is. And Megan, at least that's often, my view. yeah, and Megan, just uh, piggybacking that, uh, Steph here says she's now cold. I thought she smiled too much. So uh, does this also depend on which side you are on of this case, which is how we started uh, with this being totally polarizing? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I don't even think it depends on what what side of the case you're on. <laughs> I just think it depends on what side of the face you look at or, you know, interpretations of uh, defendants. I've heard uh, from multiple people in multiple cases have been so varied uh, where with people saying, well, I thought he showed absolutely no emotion. He was flat. And someone else saying, no, 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 he 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 kept doubling over or nodding, you know, so there's a lot of interpretation of the way defendants act. It's really high pressure. Um, I'm sure everyone has their own way to advise uh, their defendants and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't work out, I think. You know, that kind of don't show any emotion uh, is, I've heard that many times before and I think that can backfire. Um, but it's also hard to, if you're not an actor or an actress, isn't it hard to sit there and, you know, fake emotion, fake fear, fake, you know, it's 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 a lot of pressure. It's why we say on our show, we never judge people for, you know, their affect. When when we hear about interviews, oh, they didn't seem like they were shocked enough or this enough. We never judge based on affect. But unfortunately, juries do. And yeah, let me and say this. I've had so many clients over the years that I know when they get nervous, they smile. What do I tell them? Lip. I don't care if I see blood dripping down your chin, no smiles, because somebody would say, oh, I feel so sorry for her or him. Others would say they don't really care. So the less you show that you're not concerned, the better off you are. You have to be concerned. And body language and facial expressions are so important. Uh, from Scott McGinnis here, very good point. And I hear that from defense attorneys all the time that the uh, body language, facial movements, everyone is looking at you the minute you walk in that courtroom. But from Scott McGinnis here, no crime scene was ever declared or secured. All taillight evidence found in the yard should be disallowed. It was found 12 hours later in an open yard. Uh, Melanie, is all this true? And do you agree with uh, what Scott is saying here? Yeah, it was found on top of the snow after about another 10 inches to 12 inches of snow had fallen sometime around 6 p.m., which is 12 hours after his body was found. Listen, we still have yet to hear motions in limine, which are all the evidentiary motions, which will be made to exclude or include certain evidence at trial. So uh, I think Scott's right. That could be um, a motion in limine that we have yet to see. Uh, this trial is supposed to go on April 16th. I don't know how it's going to go on April 16th. That's what I was going to ask. Is it, is it going to get delayed again? 
Well, Commonwealth just gave the um, defense 500 pages of material three days ago and another thumb drive, and they still don't have DNA evidence back from that alleged hair that was on the bumper that they've told the media is a human hair, but there's no evidence of that. And they say that the Bodhi lab can't get that back until mid-April. So discovery is not complete in this case. And I don't know how it's going to go ahead on April 16th. I really don't. So don't clear your calendar yet, Joel. Yeah, it's going to screw my whole uh, flow up here. Sarah Adams says, love and miss you, Melanie Little. Oh, thanks, um, and this is a good comment. I was thinking this myself. How many years until Ben Affleck and Matt Damon co-produced a movie and TV show about the Karen Reed case? I put money on them already working on it. I would cast Jennifer Jason Lee as Karen. So there you go. People are already uh, casting roles. Uh, there was a comment earlier, uh, Melanie, for you uh, related to uh proctor and and someone else and i forget who it was because i'm reading through a million things at once wondering if they're going to be uh, compelled to testify or if they're just going to be able to give you know written statements i would imagine that you're going to say that they're going to have to testify proctor is the lead investigator in this case without his testimony this case falls apart which is why his credibility is a big problem here if he's being investigated by internal affairs and he lied to the federal grand jury which he's admitted to as well so that's a problem the other um witnesses that they talked about, those other third party witnesses, you can't cross examine a written witness statement. So yeah, under subpoena, they're going to have to come in and testify. Uh, last motion I want to get to with Melanie and then we'll wrap. Um, this is the third motion. The defense specifically wants phone records from Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, and then we throw in former Canton police chief, Kenneth Berkowitz. They want mm -hmm. records from Kenneth Berkowitz. Um, specifically the defense is focusing on two calls between Brian Albert and Brian Higgins that took place 2 22 AM on January 29th, 2022. What do we know about that call, Melanie? Oh, the butt dial call. This le the last yeah. hearing was all about this butt dial call yeah. that he swears he was asleep and they didn't talk to each other and right around that same time that the, how long to die in cold search was made on Jen McCabe's phone. Apparently there were a bunch of phone calls back and forth from them. Uh, at that same time, but they claimed that um, it was a butt dial, then there was a 17 second call. And then the one guy said he was in intimate relations with his wife when this happened. And then it, you can't even make this stuff up. And so apparently they were talking to each other on the phone right around the same time, you know, a couple hours before John Officer Don O'Keefe's body was found. Um, you know, draw your own conclusions, I guess. But by the way, I'm going to talk to Carm tonight. I talked to her 437 times a day. Don't dare call me a mama's boy. But I will uh, tweet out what she said. She's probably going to tell me now that she won't give me an answer because then she's going to be paranoid that the pro-state people, will, if she says it's a cover-up, then she'll be worried that she'll get hate from the other side and vice versa. <laughs> but if I can get an answer out of her, um, and by the way, I think I told everyone, when we were recording the audio book, and there are expletives within the book, and they were coming from her. Every time she had to read one, she refused. Uh, like a cold calculated killer, she said she never said it, even though I have it on <laughs> tape, which is my phone, and then would try to use a different word. And that held us up. So what I'm trying to get to is it's going to be hard to get an answer from Karm, but I will tweet it out at podcast STS and uh, on Instagram at Surviving Survivor. So uh, please follow us there. Um, this is another amazing panel, and uh, I was uh, informed. I learned a lot of things, which I love about this show, because I learned them from our best guests. I would say best guests, better community. One of the best guests tonight is Megan Sachs, uh, a Jersey resident, Jersey native, which is why I love her so much, a full professor of criminology and uh, the graduate program director at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And she and Amy Schlossberg have a podcast. They co-host two podcasts. Women and Crime, follow it. Women and Crime, follow it. And Direct Appeal, follow that. Direct Appeal, follow that. Uh, Rosemary wants to know if you think Karen Reed will testify and uh, your final thoughts on why this is so polarizing, which is how we started. Who is that question to? That's for you, Megan. That's all you. Do I think Karen Reed will testify? Oh, that's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. The truth is, I, I really don't know if Karen Reed's going to testify. Uh, I would defer probably to <laughs> Melanie and Daryl on this one. It's so dangerous for people to testify. Um, she was drinking. I think there's going to be some inconsistencies. So can they, you know, do the job of getting reasonable doubt done without her? 
Isn't that usually the primary question? Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to defer to the experts on this one. There you go. And what about just a final thought on why people are so worked up on either side of this case, Megan? Yeah, it's like I said before, I think it's just um, the timing of it. Uh, I think there is the timing of, you know, the police institution and the way the public feels at this certain point. Again, I, I, I can't stress enough how much I think this is David versus Goliath. Um, and this is a woman taking a stand against one of the most powerful institutions in our society that's predominantly male and saying, you know, hell no. <laughs> um, and I think people are rallying behind that. People want to root for an underdog. Um, Irene, I wish it was just one that I was worried about with my mother, but um, sadly, it's there. It's 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 immeasurable, innumerable at this point. Uh, could not count the expletives, but she means well. Super smart, by the way. Her vocabulary is much better than mine, considering she speaks six languages. And this is uh, not close to one of her wow. original. And very well read woman, my mother. Um, she's bugging me to read a novel right now. Daryl Cohen, all you have to know about him is that he uh, starred in a show, starred ahead of uh, Carol O'Connor, who is uh, Archie Bunker. What, what was that show again, Daryl? I was not a star. I was a player. It was called Heat of the Night, and I, on the last episode, was killed. So I'm very familiar with what Alec Baldwin's going through. Uh, having said that, it was fun. Anything with a star, but I have a good time, and I try to tell the truth. And that's all I've got to say, unless you ask for more. Yeah. Is she going to is is Karen Reed going to take the stand in this case, Daryl? You have a crystal ball. I would say it's a definite maybe. And the reason I say that, depending on how the evidence goes from the prosecution, the defense will make that decision at the last minute. If she takes the stand, it is fraught with danger. I was drinking. I don't remember saying that I did that. The jury will tear her up if there are female jurors. If they're male jurors, they tend to be more loving toward a female. Females will tear her apart, a.k.a. convictor, in my view. There you go. If, there you if go. it's close. That's, that's an experienced uh, attorney talking to you. Look at this. Daryl is the best with the laugh. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Melanie Little. 25 plus years doesn't look like it, but 25 plus years as a trial lawyer in New York state and federal courts, lead attorney. I find this fascinating for the plaintiffs in the clergy sex abuse case as depicted in the film spotlight. That is a phenomenal movie. If you have not seen it, she's obviously got tons of real courtroom experience and uh, does all sorts of uh, local national TV interviews of course, she tells me her favorite show is podcast STS, Surviving the Survivor, uh, even though this is her first time on. Most importantly, she is the mother of five. And right behind that, she has her own YouTube channel that you all know about. Attorney Melanie Little is the handle of the channel. Attorney Melanie Little. Um, Melanie, will Karen Reed take the stand? That's the second to last question. Uh, just so we're clear on the spotlight movie, it was not made about me. That was made about the Boston attorneys, but I did handle those cases in New York. So just want to clarify that. Yeah, yeah that'll yeah, be the yeah, next yeah. thing I get shredded on Twitter <laughs> about. But um, I am going to agree with Daryl on this. It's going to be a game time decision. It's going to depend on how the case is going, whether or not Karen will take the stand. So it's way too early to tell. Um, we're going to have to see. Yeah, we're going to have to see on that. I can't tell you right now. My crystal ball is broken. Uh, I lied. Two more, two more questions for you. Um, number one, uh, before number two of the questions is, uh, what do you do when you get skewered on Twitter? I ask because you're way tougher than me. I usually take it personally and I cry myself to bed. What do you do, Melanie? Yeah, I just, uh, I, I don't respond. That's number one. You have to just not respond because, and then I will show it to one of my teenage daughters who will say, mom, 34 people saw this tweet. Really? Like I could tweet right now, mom. And I would get 10 times the views that this 34 view tweet got. So please relax. And there so they go. ground me. That's funny. Wow. You need to exit out. Yeah. Exit out. I love your puns, Sarah. I, I love it. Yeah. The exit framing Hamlet is like, it's classic. I love it. And uh, last question. Very small question. I know you have the answer. Will she be acquitted of this crime if it finally goes to trial? I believe so. You do. I believe so. And you know, I think she's factually innocent. And I think there's so much reasonable doubt uh, that I just, there's not, there's nothing. 
I would like to somebody to show me the evidence that she did hit him with her car. That's all I'm waiting for. You Ashley. know, because people saying that she said I hit him isn't enough for me. I just can't get over that. Can't wrap my head around that. Uh, I can't get over that either. What an amazing uh, conversation tonight. I'm going to make sure to uh, tag Mel Melanie Little. I don't need, I think I looked for your don't Twitter. Are you Melanie. on Twitter? Are you on Twitter? I, 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 didn't, I tried. Her. That's how I saw it. Oh, I did? I think okay. so. All right. I'm going to have to go find you. I couldn't find you earlier, but uh, that's only because I want you to uh, share in the experience of the 40 million tweets that are going to follow. Uh, most of them, 97% yelling at me for, uh, I don't know, different For having me on the show. Yeah. <laughs> until then by the way tomorrow karm is back uh sound the karm alarm uh we are doing this story out of las vegas jeff german uh he was an investigative journalist who was murdered by a publicly elected official 12 30 tomorrow we have one of his uh friends coming on the show and karm is going to be here uh to break it down she was getting annoyed with me that i was giving her homework to do but she is well prepared we'll see you at 12 30 tomorrow and then the coe at two o'clock look at this Look at this. Great minds think alike. Ruth Markell, the matriarch of the Markell family. She's going to be on with the COE 2 p.m. Eastern time. And they uh, just said that Donna Adelson's trial is going to be moved up two weeks because of the Jewish holidays. I think the date is around September 14th or 16th. I have to check on that. Meanwhile, please don't forget May 16th, 730 Hummingbird Books, Boston. Come out and yell at me for plugging the book too much until then. Love you, America. Love you, uh, New York. Love you, Atlanta. And love you, New Jersey. And by the way, the real victim in all this is Officer John O'Keefe. Think about him today. See ya.